You know, there aren't many times when you get to create a whole new universe for a YouTube video, but this is one of those videos. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. Now, know your meme, the ball pit, not quite a digitally created reality. It's more of a iconic fail of a bunch of Tumblrites who paid some $17,000 and all they got was an extra hour in Now, you might be rightfully confused as what the hell does our bull pit have to do with digitally creating an entire universe? The grid. A digital frontier. Similar to the programmed reality of the Matrix. It has the same basic rules, rules like gravity. I tried to picture clusters of information as they move through the computer. What did they look like? Or for that matter, what does any of this tell us about reality? The answer is everything. This is life in the ball pit. You think that's air you're breathing now? Do you want to know what it is? This, quite ironically, like the Matrix, is a computer simulation of what you're breathing. And I should know, I programmed it. You know, I um, I wrote that program. Here it comes. So what did you think of her? Of who? The woman in the red dress. I designed her. And this simulation turns out to be a pretty accurate model of the real world. Ironically, this is not far from the truth. So what you're looking at here is about five billionths of a meter, five nanometers. The air you're looking at is at ambient temperature. The gas molecules here are all moving at about the speed of sound. How do I know that? Because that's pretty much what the speed of sound is. How fast these molecules are traveling. Now, if you're wondering why things traveling at about the speed of sound look so slow here, it's because time is running really, really slowly. The progress bar at the bottom there that you're looking at is about 50 trillionths of a second, 50 picoseconds. To watch just one second of air like this would take you over a hundred years in real time. Now, many people, even people who are seasoned experts in this sort of thing, when they look at something like this, are stunned at just how dense the balls in the air that they're breathing are. And when those balls hit your skin, they convey force to it. And the force of all those little balls hitting your skin corresponds to about 20 tons. Now, in my little box here, my programmed reality Similar to the programmed reality of the Matrix. It has the same basic rules, rules like gravity. There are rules like electrostatics and momentum. And what you're breathing right now can be modeled pretty accurately as an equilibrium of hard spheres. The air that you're breathing is a mixture of two diatomic gases. It's about 80% nitrogen, those are the blue ones, and 20% oxygen, those are the red ones and give or take 1% argon in pink. Your life essentially depends on this. To stay alive, you need about a thousand billion billion of those Red Bulls, those are the oxygens, every second. And without them, you die pretty quick. Breathe, just breathe. To picture, a thousand billion billion. Imagine every single person on Earth holding one of those little oxygen molecules. Why not? An oxygen. For every man, woman, and child in Zion. That sounds exactly like the thinking of a machine to me. That's about mm, a billion, ten billion people, that sort of thing. 
nowhere near what we need to get to. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to take that entire Earth with the 10 billion people holding the oxygen molecules and we're going to put one of those Earths in the hand of every single person on Earth. That's how many oxygens you need every second to stay alive. You need to consume so many of them. It's like Pac-Man on super steroids. If Pac-Man were eating molecules like this, red molecules at about one per centimeter, to eat all the oxygen molecules you need, he would be traveling about a billion times the speed of light which actually turns out isn't that fast on the big scheme of things. Even at that speed, it would take you over 10 minutes to cross our galaxy, the Milky Way. And the universe is a lot bigger than that. Indeed, the model that you're looking at here, the one that lives inside a computer, is the only way you can visualize this. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. In the real world, this cannot be seen by human eyes. Because the smallest objects that you can see are about the wavelength of light, getting on for a, a millionth of a meter, a micron or so at best. Some rough numbers. One meter is about half the height of a human. A dime is about one centimeter, 10 millimeters in diameter and one millimeter thick. Now, if you zoom in a thousand times smaller than the thickness of a dime, that's when you get to about the wavelength of light. That's about a micron, one millionth of a meter. And just to throw that all into perspective, the wavelength of light that you use to cook in a microwave is about 12 centimeters. That's about 12 dimes stuck end to end. However, I've got something cute to show you on this deep dive. First of all, we're going down to the level of microns, and each micron is a thousand nanometers. The box that I've created here is about 50 nanometers in diameter, and the drop of water inside it is about five nanometers in diameter. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? And the little drop of water inside there actually has as many atoms in it as the rest of the box of air put together. And that water there is the same stuff that makes up about two thirds of your body. Mostly giant bags of mostly water. Bags of mostly water. An accurate description of humans, sir. You are over 90% water surrounded by a flexible container. Actually, no, we're about two thirds water, 65%. I shall pass it on to Captain Picard. So a quick summary, the box here is about 50 nanometers in diameter and the little droplet of water in the middle there is about one tenth of that, about five nanometers in diameter. Way, way too small to be seen with the naked eye or visible light at all for that matter. So the nearest point of reference here would be, say for instance, when you breathe out on a cold day and you see the condensation on your breath. The droplets of water that you get there are much, much bigger than this droplet of water. You cannot see this. The only way you can visualize it is through a computer program. Now, like I was saying earlier, without the oxygen, you die within a minute or so. So how you go from spheres that are essentially hard bouncing balls to life is actually a fascinating story. And a lot of it's not that cryptic, especially when you understand how the bull pit works. A lot of this really isn't that difficult to understand. You can see it with the Mark I eyeball. So for instance, those little red balls, the oxygens, the ones you need to live, there's a huge fraction of your body devoted just to that simple reaction alone. The lungs, the liver, the spleen are all geared up just to handling oxygen in water. And the reason why so much of your body is devoted to carrying oxygen can be seen with the Mark I eyeball in this simulation. 
Now, even though this is just a computer simulation. Welcome to the desert of the real. It actually replicates the physical properties of water in the real world very well. This whole field is something called molecular dynamics, creating the world of the real one atom at a time in a computer. Right now, we're inside a computer program. Is it really so hard to believe? But oddly enough, if you understand what you're looking at here, you'll understand more chemistry and physics than many who come away from a university with degrees. Like I was saying, this is actually a pretty good simulation. It emulates reality quite well. But you'll notice two things about the water. First, damn is that stuff twitchy compared to the sedentary motion of the air molecules. You know, the ones that are traveling about the speed of sound. And secondly, the air molecules don't conspicuously go into the water. They don't dissolve in the water. That's a problem if you're made up mostly of water and you need the oxygen to live. That's the water that makes up two thirds of your body. And let me tell you, probably the most important thing about living in the bullpen. This bullpen, the one that you're looking at, which is fairly comparable to what you're breathing now, is at equilibrium, which means that every particle has, on average, the same energy. Incidentally, if all the particles didn't have the same energy, say for instance a bullet was fired through this air, what happens is that bullet hits the air molecules and in the process of doing so, it transfers some energy to them and loses some itself. It, essentially, this is what air resistance is. And that process continues until the system reaches equilibrium, at which point every particle in the system has on average the same energy. And this principle is universal. It doesn't matter whether you're re-entering the atmosphere or running an internal combustion engine. It's all about either fast gas molecules hitting big slow objects and accelerating them, or big fast objects hitting slow gas molecules and accelerating them. No, I don't believe it. It's not possible. I didn't say it would be easy, Neo. I just said it would be the truth. When you understand how the ball pit works, everything starts to make sense. So that's it. The hydrogens on the water molecules are very light. And seeing as they have the same energy as the other particles in the system, that's why the surface of water here looks so angry and agitated compared to the relatively placid looking air. You'll also notice that when the gas, the either oxygen or nitrogen, hits the surface of the water, it sticks most of the time. And then, after a short period, it gets ejected from the water surface, and it almost never goes into the water. It's an awkward thing to look at when you know that you need oxygen in your body to live. Because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. I know exactly what you mean. Now, the most obvious reason for this, you can see with the Mark I eyeball. The water molecules stick to each other like crazy. They're, they're kind of like a big ball of magnets. So the surface of the water droplet is covered with water molecules, but they're stuck there so rigidly that they almost never leave. However, the gas molecules, they will often stick to the surface of the water, but they're only held there really weakly and they'll get kicked off again very easily. And you'll also notice that the gas molecules almost never go in to the actual droplet of water itself, for the obvious reason that you've got to pull all those water molecules apart to get the gas molecule in there. And this is the practical reason why oxygen is so insoluble in water. So if I were to give you a liter of air and a liter of water saturated with oxygen from the air, well, the numbers vary somewhat with temperature, but more or less, there is about 1 50th of the oxygen in a liter of water than there is in a liter of air. Now, even when your body puts in this huge amount of effort, mostly with this protein called hemoglobin, 
it only manages to mostly recover the density of oxygen that you get in air but that's still about 50 times better than you would have if you didn't have any hemoglobin and were just relying on the regular solubility of oxygen in water. And just so we're clear how much effort your body puts into transporting oxygen, that's one of the oxygens, one of the little red balls that you need to get out of the air. And that's the protein, hemoglobin, that's used to transport it. I mean, I mean, even with a precursory inspection, it's bloody clear that there is an awful lot of protein and not much oxygen. But that only solves the problem of getting the oxygen to dissolve into the water by making it stick to these big proteins. You still have the problem of getting it in to the water in the first place, when you can see that it's really rare that the oxygen molecules will go into the water. Once they're in the water, of course, they'll stick to the hemoglobin and that's fantastic. But how do they get in there? Well, your body does this by having a huge surface area of lungs. Your lungs have about the same surface area as a tennis court. Welcome to life in the ball pit. So if you like that and want to see more like this, let me know in the comments below. And hell, if you enjoyed seeing what you were actually breathing, even if it was only as part of a computer program, give this video a thumbs up and share it with your friends because somewhere deep in my heart, I would love just once for a video like this to get more hits than say, for instance, oh, I don't know, kittens playing in a ball pit. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. And of course, hit subscribe and the little notification bell if you wanna be sure that you don't miss out on new content. And if you really like this channel, you can support it directly through Patreon. And I'll leave the links below.